couple more minutes. Uh, we have almost 300 registered uh, attendees, and uh, so we think people are still kind of coming in. We got 173 uh, right now. So uh, stay tuned just a couple more minutes, and we'll get started. Thank you. If you're just joining us, we'll be starting in just another minute. I um, uh, just want to make sure everybody's uh, logged in. Okay, I think we hit over 200 and uh, we've got 300 about registered. So I think we could probably get started. Again, this webinar will be uh, recorded so you can refer back to it if you missed anything. Um, but thank you so much for everybody uh, for the registration, the interest. Um, we we'll definitely get, getting a lot of different groups uh, represented across the country and uh, it's great that people are paying attention to this issue. Um, my name again is Ben Grusswitz. I am uh, at DPRPC, the Delaware Valley Regional Planning Commission in uh, uh, Greater Philadelphia's MPO. Uh, I also serve on the CTPP Oversight Board and uh, we've got a subcommittee that's been working on this for a while and um, we wanted to sort of give an update on where things are today with you. Um, so after I give a little bit of an overview um, we're going to hand things off to Josh Coots at the U.S. Census Bureau. He's with the Geography Division and doing lots of the grunt work on PSAP. We'll hear a little bit about the um, uh, update of the criteria and um, the contact list that Census is using to reach out to people across the country. Um, but uh, you know, and also ways that you can get um, you can get involved with PSAP. Um, and then we'll hand it off to uh, our friends in Texas, uh, Kathy Yu and Arash Mirzai. Um, and they're gonna just kind of further emphasize, particularly for transportation planners and modelers, uh, why it's important to participate in PSAP this time around. And then we wanna make sure we get a lot of time for your questions because um, this is kind of new, new to a lot of people and we're doing things somewhat differently. This decennial census on geographies and whatnot um, and we just want to make sure uh, we're, we're hearing from you and trying to an answer those questions. And Penelope Weinberger at ASHCHO is going to help us kind of read what comes in and you can feel free to, to you know, log in your questions uh, as we go along here or, um, you know, we'll unmute the phones at some point and let you uh, chime in more directly if you'd like. So with that, um, just, you know, the speed reading, uh, catch up on, on where we've been on this stuff. Uh, if you're new to this, uh, in previous decennial census, these de 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 decennial censuses, um, we kind of had two separate delineation processes. And uh, many people are probably familiar with PSAP and delineating block groups and tracks that way. It's always been pretty largely residence-based. Um, but for 
travel modelers and transportation planners, you might be aware that there was sort of a partnership of the Census Bureau and state DOTs and MPOs uh, to fund a delineation of TAZs um, to report uh, uh, data from the census, uh, for particularly for the CTPP special tabulation, um, so that people can kind of use census data for the travel models. And um, that was always sort of after the census and uh, after blocks were determined and the, uh, these TACs are essentially aggregations of census blocks. And it gave a little more attention to land uses and often kind of separated out uh, residences and workplaces and other uh, different things that might be the productions or attractions or origins and destinations of a travel model. But going forward, we've just got one, uh, one process. Uh, it's going to be CSAP. And what we've done is to try to, um, because the, the TAZ delineation process won't happen anymore, we'd like to get um, particularly block groups better aligned with TAZs and travel models. And uh, we've done some things that change the criteria so that um, the, the Block groups and tracks will still be residence based, but probably have a little bit more options for non residential uses. And we'll get to that in further depth. Uh, the other thing, just to emphasize, is that um, the CTPP is always reported at lots of different geographies, but the smaller ones uh, in the past have typically been tracks and, and TAZs um, from when we were doing decennial based CTPPs and uh, even the eight more recent ACS based ones. Um, our current uh, CTP right now is the five year uh, 2010 ACS based special tabulation. There'll be a, one for the 2016 five year uh, released early next year. And then what we're talking about as far as this change and where it impacts things is really that we're no longer going to have uh, TAZs in the next special tab. Um, and it will go to track and block groups at that point. So just a recap of uh, what we've done uh, and, and a big thanks uh, for all the people that have been uh, helping along the way. The, uh, the board announced in January that this was, we were no longer going to be reporting at the TAZ level and the delineation of TAZs was going to end, but encouraging people to get involved with PSAP. In February, the Federal Register put out the uh, Census Bureau put out the draft criteria for what PSAP would look like. In April, we held a, rep, a webinar, kind of uh, catching people up on the board decision and, and encouraging people to submit comments to the Federal Register to try to um, better accommodate our needs for transportation planning. And uh, then we had a comment period that ended with, uh, you know, this sort of successful campaign. They heard us and they, they uh, did make some accommodations in, in the delineation process, which we'll hear about uh, further today. And uh, so a big thanks to everybody who commented and a big thanks to the Census Bureau uh, staff, including Josh, who you'll hear from, for working with us. And even in the summer, we, we looked at, you know, kind of surveyed people on some of the options they were looking at and I think uh, arrived at our, our best option here. Going forward, we've got, you know, obviously today's webinar. Uh, next month, the Census Bureau is planning to publish the final criteria, but we'll talk about what's in that today, um, and uh, a list of their contacts um, around the country for hearing, you know, who's going to be submitting uh, delineation uh, geographies to them. And uh, also, just to know, and Josh will talk more about it, but the, the software and the materials for PSAP will, will go out uh, in January, and that's when the process starts in, in earnest. The quick story on the new criteria is that basically we've kept the, the standard uh, block groups uh, the way that they are based on population and, or household uh, thresholds that, that you have to meet for block groups and tracks. Um, but what we've done is sort of 
allowed uh, them to relax the area of this what's been called the special use uh, block group to track. So maybe an airport or a you know a central park or something like that that's been thought of as a non-residential area. They used to have uh, you know a criteria that that needed to be at least a square mile in urbanized areas and basically now they're lifting that so that we can kind of uh, take a smaller area but that is definitely not residential say a shopping mall and make uh, make a, a, a tract or a block group out of that so it allows um, you know them, us to kind of move forward and have these non-residential uh, spots but our earlier proposal was that we'd be kind of reporting back to the census that uh, certain non-residential areas would have a certain amount of employment in them so that we got a high enough sample that you can still do that with this but you don't have to transmit those employment counts to the Census Bureau to to legitimize that geography so I hope that's sort of clear but basically what uh, a quick illustration simply what this does is whereas before in previous uh, censuses this could have been a block group where you had uh, 600 different residents and you kind of had to do something with the employment area maybe an office park or something nearby and you just lumped it into the, the block group now we can sort of separate those out in, in something more reflective of, of the land uses there so that when you look at residents uh, residential densities the one on the left is is more accurate and so is the one on the right as far as basically no residents on the right um, and same for the employment side uh, and and this is largely what people might find a little bit more as the distinction in TACs typically um, the other thing just as an example of how the criteria works is that the Census Bureau still cares a whole lot about getting enough sam sample in a residential area so if you only hit 400 and you don't get the minimum 600 uh, for a block group area, you're going to have to go start reaching out and grabbing further uh, population into that that polygon. But they don't really care. We're not even telling them how many employees are in any given polygon. That's something for us to know. You might want to aspire to shoot for a higher number of employees so that in the CTPP and uh, for workplace or or travel flow um, commute flows you would have more likelihood of more sample in those employment areas but uh, that's not required uh, for for trying to submit something to the census bureau the goal really for us i think is and as we work together with um, traditional PSAP partners is really just to align the block group and the TAZ geographies uh, so that they could be one-to-one -one, um, but at least that they're nesting uh, to, to, you know, have a one TAZ with multiple block groups within it or one block group with multiple TAZs in it. If we can kind of align generally at the borders, then when we get uh, data any which way, uh, it's going to be agreeable to uh, a travel model or your general maps of uh, traditional uh, census geographies. So uh, that's the quick overview. Don't turn that dial. Uh, we have more information to come. Uh, Josh Coots at the Census uh, Bureau is going to talk to you now about uh, more detail about PTAP. And I'll be switch over. Yeah, let me do that. All right, how's that coming through? All right, thanks everybody. Um, and thanks, Ben, for turning that over. Um, thanks sure. everybody for participating. Josh, thanks everybody. For we see Sorry, you in presenter mode. Oh, in presenter mode. Sorry about that. Uh, oh, how do we get out of presenter mode? Oh, let's do that for a second. Present online, maybe? Uh, how do I get out of presenter mode? Same. There we go. No? <laughs> One more time. OK. 
Okay, that doesn't seem to be working. How's that look now? No? Do you have another window, Josh? It's like it, you know, I on. do, and I think that's what's going on. Is it popping yeah. up in my other one? Let me, uh, sorry about that, folks. Um, oh, you have a little check it. mark on Use Presenter View uh, toward the right yeah. of that. Uh, ah. There, try try yeah, take, that taking that off and doing it. You know, I think it's just my other, there we go, maybe this is going to do it. My other slide, ah, you know, it keeps popping up. On What if I do this? Ah, I don't know how to get it to keep from. Uh, going to a different my screen, other, isn't it's it? going to my other screen is exactly what it's doing, yeah. Ben. Um, if I switch this onto that screen. How about that? Does that work for you? That's not working either. We're not seeing it. <laughs> okay. I mean, worst comes to worst, Josh, you could probably just, you know, maximize this and hide yeah. your Let me let me try one more thing. And uh, see if this is gonna work over here. Which oh yeah, there's a monitor, it's right an automatic here. above above use pre monitor presenter two. view. How about that? There we go. That's where okay, perfect. Good. perfect. Okay. Cool. Sorry about that, everybody. No problem. Okay. So again, <laughs> thanks everybody for coming. Thanks uh, everybody for participating and dialing in uh, to get this information. Before I even get started, I do want to say, you know, this is a, a really preliminary um, outreach that we're doing uh, at the request of the transportation community, and we're going to be doing more um, more uh, presentations targeted at the PSAP participants and PSAP community uh, later in uh, in, a, in a month or two once the program really rolls out. We're doing a lot of the preliminary work right now, as Ben was saying, just trying to get our participation lists and, and just wrapping up some of the uh, internal uh, work that we're doing. But come January, um, and actually in December, we'll be rolling out um, some invites for webinars that we'll, we will be holding in January and February. So I just want to let everybody know that if you don't catch this, as Ben said, um, you know, this presentation will be recorded, but we're also going to have a whole other series that will be hosted by the Census Bureau. So you can always uh, catch catch up on that um, then. Um, but what I'm going to cover today is, uh, you know, the same information that we'll be seeing then. So um, there we go. Okay. So we're here to talk about the 2020 Census uh, Participant Statistical Areas Program, the PSAP. Um, and that's a decennial program, uh, as hopefully a, a lot of folks have, are familiar with, um, which allows partic participants to review an updated, selected uh, statistical area boundaries. As Ben said, primarily we're going to be discussing today tracks and block groups. Um, the tracks and block groups that are delineated in the 2020 PSAP will be used for the 2020 census data publications as well as ACS and other censuses and surveys. And um, as Ben alluded to, that we'll be using block groups in place of uh, TASs for 2020. So also the CTPP data will be coming out um, on uh, by block group. So I want to um, open up by discussing the organizations and uh, who are the participants, because that's one of the critical pieces that we're working through right now at the Census Bureau is identifying our participant base and who is invited to be that participant. Um, the, the PPO, as it's referred to, the primary participating organization, is the single point of contact that we have for a participating area. Uh, in general, those are identified by county. Um, but often we'll have a PPO that has multiple counties within their uh, their area of responsibility. Um, so there may be a regional planning organization um, that uh, does uh, statistical planning uh, for multiple counties. Uh, while county is our working unit, that one group may be responsible for multiple counties. Um, we, many PPOs are responsible for multiple counties, but uh, probably just as many are, are also single county 
PPOs. Uh, so one of the first questions that we have recently gotten from this group is, is how does one participate? Um, to become a PPO specifically, uh, we are working on our invite list now. We've sent out invitations early in the summer, um, and right now we're trying to just make sure that every county in the nation, uh, to the greatest extent possible, has a PPO established. Um, and by default, the 2010 participants uh, were invited as the PPO. So if you were a PPO in 2010, uh, you should have gotten an invitation at this point uh, to, again, be the PPO for 2020. Um, again, we are finalizing invitations. So if you haven't gotten um, an invite and you were the 2010 participant, um, I, my contact information is at the end of this presentation, so please reach out and uh, get in touch with me or the PSAP group, um, and we'll, we'll figure out what's going on. But we are, again, we're in the final stages of, of wrapping that up. Uh, the responsibilities for a PPO is to receive the material, so to actually do uh, the work of uh, establishing the boundaries for tracks, block groups, CDPs, and other geography included in PSAP. Um, to do that actual technical work, people will often bring on a technical, technical lead or a technical group, um, and that can be established as the PPT, the primary uh, participating technical contact. And so we can work with that uh, group as well to, um, you know, just work through that technical uh, software aspect of, of uh, making those updates. We still would require that we have a single PPO as kind of the single executive or the, the final um, sign off on that area. Um, another uh, important responsibility of the PPO and our, our participants is to uh, perform some outreach and serve as the point of contact for local data stakeholders. Um, you know, there, there are usually more than one group in an area that is has interest in the data that generated by tracks and block groups and, and other PSAP geography. Um, and we, the you know, as a Census Bureau, it, it would be very difficult for us to organize that um, communication between all local stakeholders. And so we ask that the PPO serve as that single point of contact to, to organize that and adjudicate between all of the competing interests within a locality. Um, at the end of that process, once the uh, uh, PSAP boundaries are drawn up and, and the work is done, um, then the PPO will then send in that uh, work. So we do ask that the PPO take on that responsibility of being that final sign-off uh, party to get that in. And then once uh, that initial delivery is processed, we will uh, have a process of verification where we may have other um, uh, updates and review that we have to do internally to process the, the work that was submitted. So we will send out a final verification, a final version of the uh, tract and block group uh, work that was submitted to us. And then the PPO will again be responsible for that final verification uh, sign off to take a, a, a last look at that final uh, draft of the tract and block group uh, proposal and you know, perform that sign off and review. So again, I've been referring to these statistical geographies. Uh, we are going to focus on tracks and block groups, but we do have actually a lot of geographies that are going to be within the PSAP for 2020. Uh, census tracks, block groups, census designated places. Um, that's the uh, statistical equivalent to an incorporated place or a city. Uh, census county divisions in selected states. That's in states where there is no legal county subdivision. Um, in a lot of states, uh, uh, the county subdivision is a minor civil division, um, a township, charter township, um, but that doesn't exist in a lot of states. So we've created the statistical geography of uh, census county division so that we have complete nationwide coverage. Um, and that geography is also within uh, PSAP. Um, in 2010 and previously, we also had a program called TSAP, the Tribal Statistical Areas um, Program. And for 2020, we folded that into the larger PSAP. So there's also a, 
a suite of tribal statistical geographies that will be included. Um, for the most part, that's really going to be tribal participants um, or, or uh, it'll open only to tribal participants, but um, just to kind of streamline things and also to allow uh, tribal participants to have a little bit more uh, review in the standard statistical geographies, we decided to just uh, fold that into PSAP in general. Um, so in most cases, this isn't going to be an issue for most of the folks on the call now. I just want to give you a heads up. Um, other than that, there's really no substantial change to the criteria from 2010, meaning that um, statistical geographies of uh, tracks, block groups, CDPs, CCDs, it, it, by and large, the, it's not changed. If you're familiar with a census tract is, what a block group is, you're going to be familiar with uh, the same thresholds and requirements as we had in 2010. Um, the concept and purpose is the same, the coding and naming conventions and the type of boundary features, meaning that we prefer uh, non-visible features uh, by and large. Um, the, the one big change is that we've removed the special land use area measurement thresholds, and we'll, we'll get into that um, in just a second, but that's in of particular interest to this group. So here are the uh, just characteristics of block groups. Uh, we know that block groups nest within census tracts. There are some population and housing thresholds that are associated with standard county-based block groups. Um, but I just call your attention to this uh, last row there, the special land use areas. Previously, for 2010, we had uh, size requirements for special land use areas. Special land use areas or, or um, block groups and tracts that could be delineated to set aside a certain area that has special land use that was unlike neighboring areas. So, for example, Central Park in New York City. Um, a lot of airports, uh, a lot of military reservations around the nation have been designated as special land use areas because it, the, the land use there is so different from neighboring areas and there tends to be no uh, population or housing associated with, with that area. Um, that's of interest to this group because rather than um, delineating uh, TASs, again, the CTPPP, CTPP data will be published by block group and to allow the delineation of block groups for areas that have little population or housing but may have high employment, so employment centers, um, we wanted to get rid of those uh, size thresholds to allow um, small block groups to be delineated in these work centers, in these work areas. So. You know, we want to just specifically call that out and make sure people understand that this is something that can be done for 2020, uh, you know, and uh, in, is encouraged to, uh, in lieu of TAZs and the TAZ program, um, that, you know, this is another option to target these areas with high population, but, uh, or high employment, but low population or housing. Um, there was also another change, not necessarily to the criteria, but how we delineate these areas. Um, for the past few decades, the past few uh, decennial censuses, uh, tracks and block groups, uh, the local participants have taken the lead in updating tracks and block groups. Um, so the Census Bureau did not um, make any updates to tracks and block groups before the local participants took a look at them and had the first opportunity to make updates. Um, we found that in 2010, uh, there were many counties that uh, did not, we could not find a participant where we got less participation than we uh, expected. And to remedy that and also to kind of lower the, the, the bar of effort for participants, we initiated a process where we have drafted a, um, a proposed plan for each county in the nation um, where we went through and checked the population and housing thresholds of tracks and block groups. And we also checked the boundaries to see if they 
um, aligned with our optimal boundaries and if there were um, adjustments that we could make to align tracks and block groups with other geography to make sure that things were nesting up appropriately um, or where we felt that it might be a good place to align geographies. For example, if there was a, a incorporated place that recently had an annexation, sometimes it makes sense to uh, adjust a tract or block group to accommodate for that. So we have we are wrapping those proposed plans up now and 2020 participants in their materials um, will receive both the 2010 um, boundaries that were delineated in 2010, and they're also going to um, have what we're calling this pre-SAP um, plan, which is a plan that was worked on by the Census Bureau, and we'll be uh, distributing that. Um, so invited participants will have the option to just accept those 2020 census proposed statistical areas or to update those 2020 statistical areas or to just start from 2010 and and you know go from there um, in general um, folks on this call now the level of interest um, being shown by even being on this call at this point, uh, if you are a participant, I would suggest that you uh, take a really hard look at these 2020 proposed statistical areas before accepting them. Um, you know, we at the Census Bureau really had a very, um, we, we don't have any great insight into the data needs of your particular county or area. Um, so we were basing our updates really off of very little information other than the population and housing that we expected to see in that area. Um, it's not necessarily reflected in any uh, information that you have at the ground level or any, again, any data needs that you may have. Um, so these are really just suggestions um, and it's also to try to get ahead of the curve in uh, areas where we could not find a participant in 2010 um, because what ended up happening is that in 2010 we had to do a review of those areas where we couldn't get a participant and we ended up making a lot of updates and doing a lot more work on the back end than we, than we expected or anticipated. Um, we wanted to make sure that we cover the whole nation in this 2020 uh, pre-SAP, this, this uh, rough draft that we put together. Um, but in a lot of cases, if, if there is an active participant in that county, we really suggest that uh, you, you spend a lot of time uh, making your own updates and evaluating your data needs yourself rather than just um, blanket accepting what we've put together. All right. Um, so we we did conduct an internal review of these census tracts, block groups, uh, CCDs, CDPs, and tribal statistical geographies. Um, the materials that will go out in January are just going to reflect a census tract and block group updates. Um, there have been some minor CCD and CDP updates, um, but by and large, we, we really focused on census tracts and block groups. Um, that's everything off of this slide. And some of the updates that we made is just a few examples here um, where you can see some of these uh, in, in purple, some of these kind of less than optimal boundaries that we had in uh, census tracts. Uh, from 2010. You know, some of these were uh, just kind of propagated through the years. Some of them are old, just old legacy, like we can see this uh, hydrological feature in, uh, on the, the right side there. Uh, so a lot of this was just cleanup that we were doing. Um, and so we really encourage everybody, if you do see anything else uh, remaining, like these, these kinds of issues that, you know, you, you go ahead and clean it up in your review if you're not using our um, proposed uh, updates. And then another one that I had um, uh, mentioned earlier, uh, the red was a uh, incorporated place boundary, uh, the purple is a census tract, and you know it, it really makes a lot of sense to align that census tract with that incorporated place boundary. For whatever reason, it wasn't done previously, and we went ahead and, and made that um, update in our proposed plan. And again, I would say, you know, just calling out as, as something that, you know, if, if you're um, using your own, uh, 
using your own plans that you just think about these other things about how geography nests and and how we can uh, you know kind of keep these slivers from happening. Um, CDPs again. It's another. Um, again, we didn't spend a, a whole lot of time on this internally in the Census Bureau so far. We are not going to be putting out uh, significant CDP updates. We really focus on tracks and block groups. But I just do want to take a second to call out um, the function of CDPs, uh, how important they can be to local communities, local data stakeholders. Uh, it's another geography that we really expected to get a lot more interest in 2010, um, and we didn't. And so we, were, we really would like uh, data stakeholders, PPOs, to you know review this CDP criteria um, and really take a hard look at their um, areas of responsibility and see if there's any CDPs that can be delineated for 2020. And again, you know, just take an eye to seeing if there are any little slivers or gaps in, in CDP boundaries that can be updated. Again, all of these geographies are only updated every 10 years, CDPs, CCDs, tracks, block groups. So there are a lot of kind of issues that may have crept in in, this, in the uh, intervening years that just need to be addressed and cleaned up as much as possible. Uh, this is the software that'll be used, that'll be provided. Um, it's uh, we're calling it GUPS. It's a Geographic Update Partnership software. If you participate in any of our other um, participant programs, such as uh, Boundary and Annexation Survey, BAS, or uh, school districts, or uh, any of another number of our uh, geographic partnership programs, you, you may be familiar with this already. It's the platform that we're really building all of our partnership software on. Um, it's built on QGIS 2.18.15. Um, that's what's going to be distributed in January. Um, we'll be mailing out the software, instructions on using the software, and it'll be we'll be sending out all of the shapefiles and uh, geographic uh, data that you need to conduct a PSAP review of whatever your area of responsibility. If you have one county, five counties, or 20 counties, we'll be sending all that data on a DVD, um, and we request that you use this software to make any updates, um, and that'll facilitate that uh, back and forth handoff of the data. Um, it's, we've made it as streamlined as possible um, to go ahead and make the updates. Uh, it'll walk you through the data, I identify any geographies that are um, outside of the criteria, outside of the thresholds that are too small, too large, and as you're updating the software, or the geographies, the software will be checking to make sure uh, that whatever's created uh, adheres to our criterion guidelines. Uh, so it'll just make everything uh, a little more streamless on, uh, uh, seamless on both sides of the update. Uh, here's the schedule. So we are um, rolling into um, the January 2019 mail out materials. Uh, we are still working on getting our final participant list uh, locked down. We will be publishing that list of the final uh, invited uh, PPOs uh, soon, um, probably mid-November. Um, and that we'll have more information coming out on our website, a little more detailed breakdown of our PSAP schedule. Uh, and, and looking through the end of the program. Um, so as you can see, the January 2019 uh, is where the delineation phase is going to begin. Delineation phase meaning, uh, you know, that the opportunity to actually start working with the software, working with the boundaries and making updates will begin in January 2019. Um, I think the webinar trainings may begin a little earlier than February, maybe the last week of January that we actually start uh, the webinars, so just an FYI on that. Um, and from we'll be tracking when uh, folks take the webinar uh, to ensure that they have at least 120 calendar days to make the updates to their uh, area um, before sending it in. So we'll, we'll, we'll guarantee that 120 days from when you sign up for the webinar. Um, 
and then the July 2019 is when um, all of the materials will have been in and we will have uh, processed a, a lot of that. So we'll be ingesting that and then doing a, a adjudication between other geographies in our system. So we'll be matching those uh, tracks and block groups and CDPs and CCDs uh, to all of our other levels of geography and making sure everything lines up and we don't have any uh, inadvertent data disclosure issues where we have some slivers or gaps between geography. Um, and then this January 2020 verification begins and that's when we will be sending out uh, that quote unquote cleaned up version of the tracks and block groups that will include any updates that we had to make because of that boundary adjudication or any geographies that um, didn't meet our criterion guidelines. So if we have to make any adjustments, this is when you will see that in January 2020. So that will not be final um, until that verification phase is closed out. So PPOs, participants will have 90 days to review that uh, draft version, the verification version of the boundaries. If there are any updates, we're happy to work through them um, at that point and we'll, we'll get everything as, as uh, neat and tidy as we can. Um, and once we have that sign off at the end of that 90 days, uh, we, we will lock these boundaries in place uh, in preparation for uh, data publication using those boundaries. So here's currently, uh, we have a portal up now that shows counties um, and the coverage um, of, of responses, so PPOs, so we have the different levels, if it's a county participant or a uh, regional agency participant. We're still working through this, this is a, a work in progress, um, and if you want to follow that, we have all of this information on our, uh, our webpage here, right where the right red arrow is, is where you can uh, click to navigate through and find that map. We'll be updating that map as, as, uh, as we finalize our process and our invite list. We'll also be posting the full invite list. So if uh, you are not the PPO, you're not the primary participant, you'll be able to come to this website and navigate to see for your area, your county, who is the PPO. It'll have their contact information and give you some, uh, 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 you know, it, it'll give you the information you need to go ahead and contact them if you have any updates to make, um, if you have any requests of them of track block group updates that you want to see for 2020, uh, it'll give you the contact information for that PPO. And, you know, primary participants also, just FYI, uh, that contact information will be up here so it'll provide a venue for your local stakeholders to reach out and contact you. And that is part of the, uh, again, the expectations to be a primary participant is not only that you review and update the statistical areas, but you conduct some level of outreach uh, within the participation area, so within the area of your, your responsibility, uh, and as much as possible to solic solicit input on draft delineations. Um, some stakeholders or some participants will, uh, you know, set up stakeholder meetings and have people come in and just review draft track plans or, uh, you know, solicit any needed updates uh, for the 2020 plans. Um, the county-based participants, are, are, again, are the primary participants are expected to use GUPS to review and modify their updates. Again, they can select to uh, elect to have a technical uh, technical lead to do that work. Uh, could be in a different organization. We just ask to be um, alerted um, and get their information provided to us, their contact information. If you do elect to have someone outside of your organization do that technical work, we just want to get a heads up so we can contact them with any follow-ups that are necessary. Um, tribal participants, I don't know if there's any uh, uh, tribes that are represented on the phone today, but th there will be the opportunity to use paper maps. So that, that is a, a default option for tribal participants. Um, uh, and again, we also you know, expect uh, primary participants to participate in the final verification processes. So there will be a back and forth between uh, the Census Bureau and the Office of the PPO, um, and we just need you know, participation at, at all phases of that. Um, we may also get questions at the Census Bureau about tracks and block groups for a given area. 
And we just want to let you know that we will be uh, passing along contact information to local stakeholders or folks with um, you know, questions about that 2020 plan. And the expectation is that these stakeholders will get their questions answered or at least uh, have be provided a forum to get their uh, questions heard. Um, and again, we, we will be posting contact information on the uh, Bureau of Census, uh, Census Bureau PSAP website. Here's my contact information, my direct contact information. And for the program, these are, uh, you know, if you just have general PSAP questions, uh, feel free to reach out to PSAP. Uh, given my workload these days, it might be a, a, a better uh, strategy to contact me and uh, CC the PSAP uh, email there. Um, and if there's any questions, I'd be happy to uh, take them at the uh, an question and answer time that we have uh, available. Actually, I think we should um, modify this as Penelope. I think mm -hmm. we should ask the questions that have come for you now. Okay, great. It makes more sense while they're, you know, people are Sounds sort of good. thinking about it. So, uh, Ben, if that's okay with you. Um, do you want me to read the questions to you or could you see them here, Josh? Uh, I'll just read them. The first yeah. question okay. uh, is, our organization completed the contact update and product preference forms, but the geographic extent for which we are designated as the PPO is not defined on those forms. They serve multiple counties. How can they see or determine the geographic extent? That's an excellent question. Uh, I would say to uh, if you do have a question like that, go ahead and reach out to me. Um, and again, cc this geo.psap, and we'll check your um, invite versus what has been assigned to you in terms of the counties. I don't have a way to do that right now, and until we get um, that invite list posted with the participant to county list, I don't think we have anything publicly available that I can direct you to. So go ahead and reach out to me, and we'll, we'll take a look at, at what's going on there. Okay. And uh, to what extent will 2020 block groups and or tracks align with MCD geography? Uh, now, that that's an excellent question. Um, kind of inside baseball, so I'm glad to get these kind of questions. Um, people thinking ahead. There are some areas where MCDs have been laid out to have a relationship with tracks and block groups. There are some parts of the country, MCD boundaries are very stable, um, and there is a long established relationship between tracks and block group boundaries. Um, some parts of the country, they're not. I'd need to know your exact area to know whether or not that has been uh, established or not. Um, so it's kind of, it, it's hard to say as a blanket statement. Um, if you have had that nesting in the past, if you have had a relationship in the past with those geographies, that should be maintained in the future. That's not something that we have intentionally um, caused any issues with. Tracks are intended to be very stable geography. They're intended to not change from decennial to decennial census. So again, if there was a relationship in the past, that should be maintained in the future. Um, again, go ahead and contact me if you have further information. I'd also uh, direct you to Tiger Web. I don't, I don't have a slide on that here, but um, if you're not familiar with it, you can go ahead and go to our website and just do a search for Tiger Web, T-I-G-E-R-W-E-B, and that's a, a web app that we've developed that shows our current geography. Uh, so it will show, you can zoom in, uh, you know, drill down to your area and turn on the MCD layer turn on the tracks layer, turn on the block groups layer, and you can see what we have in the system right now. Um, so you can start thinking about updates that you want, and you can start uh, seeing if there is that relationship in your area if you are unsure about it. Okay. Uh, the next question is, will pre-SAP suggestions indicate reasons for the proposed changes? They will not. That's another good question. And another one that I, I really want to spend a, a minute um, really talking about is that it, the only input that we had was the population and housing um, that from 2010, and we we did a, a very unscientific um, estimate uh, based on the the um, housing that we have in our system now, and just a, a rough uh, estimate of 2.5 uh, persons per household. Um, so just very back of the envelope just to get an idea if 
an area had really expanded in, in uh, population and housing or not. Um, and then we went ahead and made these proposed updates based on that information. Um, and we also made some adjustments uh, to kind of better align with geography. Sometimes we'll have tracks or block groups using, um, you know, small streams or other hydro hydrology as boundaries. Um, and, you know, over the years that changes pretty frequently. So we were sometimes shifting off of a, a stream or creek onto a road. Um, just to kind of try and stabilize the geography as much as we could by tacking it to more stable uh, features, linear features on the landscape. Um, but we didn't have any insight as to the data needs of your area. We didn't have any special insight onto any of the, the uses that you put your data to or, you know, any, I don't know, censuses or surveys that your county or locality may conduct themselves. We don't. We didn't look at any zoning plans. We didn't look at you know proposed development plans for your county. So this is again really mo mostly targeted at areas where we didn't have participation in 2020, just to make sure that we weren't caught at the very end again um, having to make updates to significant portions of the nation. So if you're on this call today and you're participating in this call and you have this level of interest, I'm guessing that you have a participant or you are the participant for your county. And so I'd really suggest taking a very, very hard look at the proposed plans that we're putting out. Um, because again, we don't have the level of insight that you do, that I'm assuming that you do, um, just from the fact that you're on this call. Okay. Uh, the next question is, how do we find out if we're on the PSAP participant list? Uh, you should have gotten an invitation already. Um, if you have not gotten an invitation already, again, you can contact me or you can wait until we put out our uh, invitation list or our confirmed participant list, which should be coming out within the next couple of weeks. And again, it'll be on the website that I, I showed. If you go to our census.gov website, along with uh, doing a search for Tiger Web, uh, you can also do a search for 2020 PSAP, and you'll find that website that I had um, a couple screens back, um, and all that information will be posted there. Uh, but we don't have that publicly out yet because we're still tweaking the uh, invite list and trying to track okay. down. Yep. So the next question is, there's a pile of questions, so <laughs> we're going to try to get through as many as oh, possible before okay. we let uh, Arash and sure. Kathy talk. Uh, Josh Marikaminowitz says we're a PPO, but we have counties that want to do the delineation themselves. How do they implement that? Uh, that is going to be another reach out. That's one of the things that we're finalizing right now is, is trying to see if there are uh, PPOs from 2010 that need to break out or add counties as soon as possible. Uh, give us, a, uh, shoot me an email. Uh, the information is on the screen. Um, okay. Give me your contact information. We'll, we'll work that out. And then the, uh, what happens if counties do not have anyone to do the job? And that, again, is why we put those proposed plans together. We we had a very significant amount of the nation that just did not have participants. Um, uh, those counties will use the 2020 proposed plans that we put out. Um, so that's what will be implemented. Okay. Uh, the um... We are the regional planning agency in Connecticut, but the PSAPs were set up by county, which were delegalized in the 60s. Can we redesign <laughs> right. the PSAPs to match the state planning organization outlines? Uh, I would, again, urge you to get in touch with us as soon as possible so we can work through that. Yeah. It's a good thing the Census Bureau is all about personal service. We're going to just keep uh, going with questions for five more minutes, and then we're going to okay. move on to the next presentation. No matter how many of these questions we get to, maybe we can circle back. Um, how will we handle cases where PPO's jurisdictions don't align with the county boundaries? Sounds like the same question again. Yeah, since the since the county is the uh, primary unit, apologies to Connecticut, uh, but counties are the primary unit that we have. Um, we ask that if some, we we have a few cities, for example, or townships that have requested to be the p primary participant, and we just request that they perform uh, updates on the entire county. So we just request that they commit to making updates to the entire county. 
Okay, so uh, a, how yeah. will you handle cases where the jurisdictions don't align with county boundaries? You just want them to expand to the county or contract to the county? That, that, that's right. Yeah, commit to a certain number of counties. So if, if they are within two or three counties, uh, but they don't cover the entire uh, extent of those two or three counties, we just request that they, you know, complete the work for the entire unit, so the entire county. Uh, we've, okay. got, again, got some cities that are not, you know, wall-to-wall -wall or contiguous with a, a county, and we just ask that they do all the work for that entire county. It's just the unit that was uh, most amenable to their work processes, and that's traditionally okay. what we use as county. Um, what are the ramifications of including small population numbers in special use areas? Should we really aim for the none in little to none? Uh, we request that um, you do aim for none or you meet the uh, the minimum, so it would be 1,200 for population. Uh, the, the real danger of that is just that um, your data is going to get suppressed, and that's really one of the biggest dangers, um, other than potential data disclosure. But we have pretty robust data disclosure uh, review, um, and what will probably happen is that you'll just get uh, your data suppressed, or the margin of error will just be so high that it, it, it will just be not very useful for you or just not a, a very representative of the population actually there. So th that's really the, the, the drive behind saying little to none or meet the thresholds. All right. So if, if, mm -hmm. uh, what is the projected coordinate system used for the census? Projected coordinate system used for the census? Uh, I, we don't project our data, so... We, we we don't use projected data, so whatever you want to use. Okay. Um, will PPOs be able to have multiple instances for the QGIS software to allow for multiple people to edit the data? Will QGIS allow for multiple people to edit the data? Um, that is really going to... No, we don't have any, unfortunately. I mean... Uh, we don't have a way to do that at this point. Okay. Um, are block and block group boundary alignment geographic suggestions accepted by the Census Bureau for the CDPP TAS activity applied to other Census Bureau products such as ACS? I can tell you the answer is no, um, yeah. Michael. I can answer that one. Uh, next yeah. question is, we are an MPO and earlier in 2018 hosted the 2020 LUCA review with our regional members and, and, and we serve as our region's PPO. Can you provide any examples or ideas on stakeholder outreach? And at what point specifically would you recommend should this be done within the review process? Should our outreach invitation mimic that invite list? Uh, I'm unfamiliar with LUCA or what was done with LUCA, um, but I, I would say as soon as possible start doing outreach um, because in you know intervening years, you know for the since 2010, basically the PSAP closed, we've been getting um, requests for data, requests for um, you know, information about tracks and block groups uh, for people who are applying for various grants or, you know, business proposals, that kind of thing. Um, so I know that there's a lot of interest there. Uh, and, and so we, we've also gotten a lot of interest from groups that were unaware of PSAP, unaware of who their PPO was, but still had a lot of interest in census tracks um, and block group data. Um, in terms of who to reach out to, uh, you know, there's usually, I, I don't know, Chamber of Commerce or different business groups. There's usually uh, other data, more data-driven uh, groups, maybe local university um, has a geography department. Some, they might be able to help you out with that. Um, but, you know, planning organizations, development organizations, I, I you know, to, to reach out to as many folks as you can, at least just give them a heads up that this is coming or underway. And that questioner says, thank you. And we have just two more questions. Can we add our own geographic layers inside the GUP software, like parcels, updated aerials, et cetera, to help with drawing new boundaries? Yeah, absolutely. Um, absolutely. Uh, we really encourage the use of imagery. We're going to have some uh, links. Uh, once you get the software, you'll see that we, we've included some uh, ways to get imagery into there. Um, parcels are fantastic. We really encourage the use of uh, parcels as a re reference layer. And QGIS is a fully functional GIS. So anything you can use in any other GIS platform, you, you can bring in the QGIS. If you have your own 
you know, zoning plans or, or any other layers that you of interest, uh, we really encourage you to bring that in and, as a reference layer and, and make your updates. Great. And if our organization, a city government, is registered for our place geography, should we be the PPO or work with our surrounding counties to participate as well? Uh, sorry, Penelope, can you one, one more time from the top? If, if our organization, which is a city right. government, is right. registered for our place geography, should we be the PPO or work with our surrounding counties to participate as well? Sorry, I guess it's just that registered for as your place geography. Okay, so you're a city, you're within a county. Mm -hmm. uh, if you mm -hmm. have not gotten a, a, a invite at this point, I think you can assume that the county that you're within got an invite or a larger planning organization that your county can probably point you to is the participant for your area. Uh, again, anybody on the call, if you haven't gotten an invite at this point, you probably assume uh, pretty safely that you're not the PPO. So start, uh, you know, reaching out to the PPOs again. We will be posting that finalized list soon. Um, but, uh, you know, start start working with your other stakeholders, other organizations in the area. Reach out to your county planning organization. That's usually a good start. Um, there's usually an office in the county is designated to either be that PPO or is participating in the effort. Um, and I'd reach out to them. Great. Thank you so much. Um, ben, I'm going to turn it over to Kathy. Yeah, well, just real quick, uh, just a clarification off of Mara's earlier uh, question about um, if your counties want to do the, the work of the delineation themselves. I mean, I think every MPO that has it, it's the PPO kind of has different ways of dealing with the counties on it, but basically I think you could have them do it, send you the geographies, and that you're the ones basically transmitting the, the new geographies. Isn't that correct, Josh? And that's, uh, again, I mean, you know, Ben, I guess in, in your position as, as being a planning organization with multiple counties within your, your area, um, you know, it, it, we kind of leave it up to that PPO of how to work that out. Um, you know, we, we try not to get kind of into that nitty gritty. Uh, every organization, every area kind of has their own dynamics and we don't really want to step into that or impose. Um, so if that is what your organization is comfortable with, that's great. If you want to, you know, have a pizza party and invite all of your stakeholders there and, and do it on the fly together Saturday night, I mean, that sounds like fun to me. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's kind of how whatever works, um, but we do ask that there's just one solid proposal that's that's given to us, not piecemeal. Um, so if if you are the PPO and you're committing to five counties, we ask that you submit us five counties, not that you farm it out and all five counties submit five different proposals to us. Yeah, so we, we yeah. just want to have that consolidated, but. How that how that works at that operational level, we, we really we'll, we'll do what we can to facilitate, but we're pretty agnostic about how it happens. Awesome, thanks okay. for the clarification, and Absolutely. I think we should pass it off to our friends at North Central Texas Council of Governments. Thanks. Good afternoon. Um, following up with Ben and Josh's presentations, um, I just wanted to mention why NCCOG feels that PSAP participation is important. So this is a unique opportunity that we have that only happens every 10 years, where we have the opportunity to define census tracts and block groups. And so NCCOG is participating because we know it's beneficial to align our transportation analysis zones with census tracts and block groups. And we feel that TASAs are best positioned if they don't cross the borders of these geographies. TASAs, which nest within the tracts and block groups, inherit the census and ACS data. And so it could be fed directly into reports and travel models without processing. If, we, if the tests don't nest within these geographies, then we have to start approximating information from multiple geographies. And this can be a complicated process. And honestly, we actually have that in a situation now where we have a TAS that's not aligned and straddles multiple block groups. And we have to do a lot of calculations in order to get the data in the correct format. Um, and as we know, ACS and census data is, we use so many tables from that from total population, households by size and type, um, population by race is used for environmental justice. And if you use market segmentation, segmentation of households, then tracts and block groups are important um, 
both geographies are important because you can get market segmentation of households um, by vehicles by number of workers at census tract level and segmentation of households by income group at the block group level. Sorry. Um, defining these geographies is also important for if you use CTPP. Um, after, as Ben mentioned, after CTPP 2012 to 2016, CTPP will no longer provide data by TAS geography, but will report it by block group geography. And many people use CTPP data for commuting trips and worker flows, but there are actually two other parts of CTPP that are also useful and should be considered. Um, they include further segmentation of the household and workers. So you can actually get things like household distribution by number of workers, vehicles, and household income, um, or household distribution by household size, workers, and household income. And they also have worker distribution by household characteristics, including worker distribution by household income. So if you're going to be using these CTPP tables, you really want to make sure that your block groups are defined appropriately. This is also your opportunity to create well-shaped and logical geographies. Um, as was mentioned, that previously block groups could only be defined if they meet a minimum population. But with these new rules, um, we can change that. So you might have a block group with a mall or a hospital, which has no population, but it had to be in a block group originally with some adjacent population. But now we can redefine that block group. We can have a block group just for the work, the employment center, like a, a mall or a hospital, and then have a separate block group for the residential population. And in this way, your block groups are more homogeneous and the data from them will make more sense. We also, it's also important to review the tracks and block groups um, in case they need to be updated due to any growth in the area or any new facilities that have been built. Um, it's also an opportunity to kind of reshape any kind of unusual tracks or block groups. For example, you might have something like an L-shaped census tract, which is which we took a picture from our own. And now with, if the population minimums are met, you can divide this L-shape into two rectangular shaped geographies. By census is used across many areas of expertise. If we can start producing reports and tables which are in the census geography, then the data is more able to be communicated, more easily communicated to other analysts, to other areas of areas, and it kind of creates a common language for everyone to use. There's also a human factor in this by planners and modelers participating in this process, talking to MPOs or cities, counties, other entities, and Census Bureau, where they're kind of, they're getting exposure to other, uh, to the community in general, and also getting exposure for the model as well. So we're not just talking about participation, we actually are also um, directly participating in this process. Um, NCT COG represents the North Central region of Texas, where we, um, our region includes 16 counties. We have volunteered to be the primary participant or PPO for the counties in our region. And so we will be working with all of these local governments to, um, to work to develop some geographies for each of the counties and making that submission to census. So we do encourage you, whether it's as a PPO or as just a, an individual participant to to be part of this process. But that's all I had, Ben, if you wanna go back to you. Okay, well, thank you so much. Um, I uh, really uh, appreciate the emphasis on, on the participation here. And uh, I, I uh, think we wanna continue to just um, get some more feedback from you all uh, attending. And uh, if it has, Penelope, has there been any more uh, questions rolling in? There is one more question for Josh. Um, and the question is, will you provide guidelines on how many special use areas can be defined? How many can be defined? I don't, I mean, as long as they meet that criteria of having little to no population, uh, I don't think we have an upper limit. Um, I, you know, again, I'd say reach out um, once the delineation phase starts, or um, if you have questions now, you can reach out to me. 
um, but I don't think that's something that we have a real upper limit on. Uh, we want to make sure they're useful, they're functional, they're actually representing something and not just every, uh, you know, small neighborhood park or something to that extent, but I think we're pretty flexible at those. But uh, if, if you have a special situation, again, feel free to reach out to me. One of the things we're thinking about at DVRPC is that, you know, we have some large areas that are just employment, and we may not just put that into one uh, special land use block group. We'll probably divide it up into different sections of that uh, office, office park or um, our Navy Yard, for instance, is a, a very large employment center. Um, so it'll it'll kind of look a lot more disaggregate like our TAZs in that area, whereas now there, it's just a giant uh, triactor block group. Yeah, I mean that's a great example, Ben, and that's really you know one of the one of the reasons that we we thought that this would be a good way to accommodate your group's needs. Um, you know, just take that size threshold away. And I could see something like what you're talking about, where you have a large area that's maybe an entertainment district abutting an industrial district abutting a airport, you know, and you may want to have a separate special land use uh, block group delineated for each one of those separate areas and really be able to parse out that different uh, employment centers and different land use and different employment types. Um, I mean, that's really how we're envisioning it being uh, put together also. So that, that's a great example. And LP, uh, is there anything else rolling in, or is are we uh, uh, going to open up the phones for unmuting people if they want to just um, chime in? Um, I think that probably usually creates a ton of problems with feedback and with different people yeah. having their yeah computer and their. Unmuting but there are more questions. Are... People are continuing to type them, so if we're good with that, I'm just going to keep reading them out. Um, so, gonna, uh, 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 you know. Uh, resources slide here just so people have it and copy things down. Okay. So uh, Chad Harris asks, what if there's a boundary issue with an actual census block, not a block group? Can that be remedied through PSAP? Um, I, I need to know what that, again, I, I hate to fill up my inbox, but I, I'd need to know what is going on with that to address it. Census blocks are built through an automated uh, process that we have, an, an algorithm. And so just really high level in general, um, roads are held as block boundaries. All geographic boundaries, all political boundaries, states, counties, MCDs, block groups, tracks, are all held as block boundaries. Um, so it, it's not something that we have a whole lot of impact on. Um, there are a couple uh, very limited opportunities for people to make updates, but usually those have to do with voting districts and some other uh, kind of specialty geographies that we have. Um, so in general, creating blocks is not something that we have any interactive impact on, um, again, with a few limited opportunities. So if there is a quote unquote problem with a census block, I'd be happy to work through it with somebody if they want to contact me, but in general, that that's not something that we typically do. Okay. Um, so uh, Paul asks again, Josh, we, you stated that we should begin outreach to stakeholders now. So setting a meeting date of mid-February makes sense after the GUPS software materials are received in January? I, I think that makes a lot of sense. And, you know, I, again, um, I, I would, uh, if, if you have your own tract and block group materials to distribute to folks to take a look at, I'd encourage you to do that. If not, I again encourage you to go to census.gov and take a look at our Tiger Web uh, web app, uh, T-I-G-E-R-W-E-B, um, which would, you know, you could just distribute that link to your data stakeholders and have them to take a look at your area, at the current uh, census geography, and see if they have any updates. Um, you know, it, it's, I, I encourage you to get a head start because that 120 days is going to burn up really quick. Okay. Uh, the next question is for me. It's, are you going to share the slides? The answer is yes. We're recording this webinar, and we'll be posting the recording of the webinar. We may clean it up a bit just to take a little of the excess uh, waiting around stuff out from the beginning, and we will post that together with a downloadable version of all three presentations so you can review it again and share it with your colleagues. Um, Josh, in a county where tracks nest within civil divisions, 
there's one track that crosses the municipal boundary. Would you recommend changing that track or keeping it as for con keeping it as is for continuity? Yeah, I, you know that is one of the um, the real hallmarks, one of our, our real touch points with uh, tracks is that we really like to have that uh, data comparability um, across decades. So if that tract has looked like that for you know multiple decades, you know again without knowing this particular instance, we would probably ask that it remain the same. It also depends how far off it is. I mean if we're talking you know, a relatively small area in proportion to the size of the, the MCD and the tract, it, you know, and there's not a whole lot of population that would be impacted, or, or even if there was, it, it may be appropriate to, to line all that up, especially if you're saying that all the other MCDs and tracts in the, in the, um, in the county are, are aligned. So, I, unfortunately, I, I don't really want to prescribe any specific, but again, <laughs> if you want to reach out to me, I'd be happy to take a look and we'll see Josh, is that something that somebody would in the software like comment and like propose the change in that track, you know, yeah. boundary I'm, and then explain that is, why and then that's you exactly all right, essentially review it, right? That's exactly right. That's exactly how it would work. Um, if you want to reach out to me ahead of time and, and talk about it, we could save some of that back and forth maybe or think about other options to get ahead of it, but yeah, that is exactly right, Ben. That's the whole point of uh, the software is that, you know, you can go through and make updates to your tracks to, you know, impose some order that you think should be there that is not currently. And then you do have the opportunity, exactly like you said, Ben, to uh, record a justification for that, kind of explain what's going on and why you made the update. And then, uh, again, we'll have a nice back and forth about it. There will be another opportunity through the verification phase for us to have that conversation again. Um, but you know that that is the point of the program. Yep. Okay. Uh, does the software allow for a county to export their updates and send them to their representing PPO of multiple county RPA in order to import and compile into the one county update? Uh, well, the it, it would in that um, if I'm understanding the question correctly, if there is a an RPO with multiple counties within that area. Um, and each county within there wants to do their own work, uh, the software is, it, it's a county-based program, and the software organizes the work by county. So if the PPO wants to farm that work out to each county and have them work each county separately, each county is a discrete work package. So if what I'm understanding, I, yes, I think is the answer. It, it could be done. I think the question is about compiling it, stitching it back together. Is that yeah, something I mean, that software piece, is going to do? Yeah, that, in, in that piece of it, uh, I don't think it stitches it together. I think it would just be reported up as a separate, you know, each one separate package. But again, we can work through that in the, the delineation process, and, and that is something we're expecting to work through. So um, I, I'm, we will figure out a way to make it work if, if there are any issues with it. Okay, and I just have one last question so far, so if you've still got more questions, keep them coming. We do have a few more minutes before we knock off, but uh, since the size of census tract and block group can, might change, will we be able to keep historical change? If so, how? To keep historical change? Um, uh, Keep historical change. For I'm that entirely time series sure. analysis, I think. Like so, yeah. and and correct me if I'm wrong, Josh. But for the Census Bureau view, the tract is something that you guys probably want to keep as intact as possible. That's, that's right. Um, and then you kind of, but for block groups, you're 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 not as interested in you know holding fast to uh, previous delineations. It's really the tract that is seen as the one to preserve for time series and. Even if they wind up getting split in a new one, you there's a way to crosswalk it to aggregate it back up to compare to the previous census. Yeah, that's right, Ben. So in general, with census tracts, we do discourage uh, what we call retracting, so taking a county and just kind of wiping out what's there and creating brand new tracts. If a tract needs to be updated, we, you know, generally uh, what we ask is that the tract is either split right in half or into multiple pieces it's still nest within that original tract or that the tract is merged with the neighboring tract in whole 
Um, so we can always go back and kind of separate those pieces out like little Lincoln logs or Lego pieces. Um, and we don't just, you know, completely re re restructure those boundaries. And as Ben said rightly also, uh, in, in terms of the Census Bureau, we, we have a lot less uh, concern about block groups and we think of them as a geography that if a locality or, or participant wants, they can completely wipe out the block groups and redraw all the block groups in a county. There are a lot of um, localities and, and partners that we have, local partners that try to keep um, comparability with their block groups and they try not to reshape their block groups for their own historical comparability. Um, but that's not a requirement that we have. We, we really see block groups as being a lot more uh, flexible and dynamic than census tracts, which we really see as very static. Um, if there is a need to make significant updates to tracts, we can work through it, but we, we generally discourage it. I'd also encourage people to take a look at you know, the statistical significance from one year to the next of those block groups and see if you really feel like the changes you're seeing are, are actual changes or whether it's just sort of noise from the data from the sampling um, because uh, those are pretty small geographies with usually pretty large uh, margins of error de depending on the variable you're looking at. Um, so you might use time series, uh, but it might not be showing any change other than just kind of uh, sampling error. Yeah, it might not be showing what you think it's showing. Um, Josh, I had a question about um, what's getting delivered in the GUP software. Sure. Um, is the, um, are we getting uh, 2010 data from census um, and we're looking at, at that as far as where the population mm -hmm. is? Or are we mm -hmm. getting any newer, uh, like uh, uh, from ACS or Population Estimates Program? No, for, so for, for PSAP, we, we are only going to be distributing the 2010 uh, decennial counts, so the population and housing thresholds that you'll see and have access to in, in GUPS uh, will be the 2010 100% counts. And that, uh, and then the in terms of uh, GIS, you know, actual layers that you'll be working with, you'll we'll distribute the 2010 layers. So what was what was done for the 2010 tract and block group plans, CDPs, CCDs, all the other layers. Um, but we're also going to distribute these 2020 proposed tract and block group plans. So you'll also be able to take a look at the work that we did um, and the updates that we made. Um, and, and you can use those as a reference. Again, you know, you can do what you want with them, completely throw them out, modify them, accept them if, if you'd like. Then those, again, as I mentioned, those were made um, based on estimates that we put together internally. Um, those counts that we base them on, the, the data that we base them on is not going to be distributed. It's uh, It was really an internal um, just kind of guesstimate to give us a rough rough guide of, of what we have internally in our system and, and make some updates that we thought were appropriate based on that. Um, but again, local stakeholders know their data and needs much better than us. I really, again, uh, implore everybody to take a really hard look at those 2020s before accepting them. And there is one more question about the special use areas. What happens if there's a small number of residents in a pot potential special use area? Or must the special use area be zero people? I think you uh, addressed this before, Josh, but if you could give us a recap. Yeah, absolutely, sure. Yeah, so again, it's it's uh, in most of our publications, we don't say none, we say little to none. So we recognize that even in some parks, we may have transient locations or maybe, uh, you know, people that are you know, living in a park uh, and unsanctioned uh, housing. Um, so, again, little to none. What happens to that population? Again, I mean, the biggest danger that we see with this is that you won't get data for those those people living there. Um, they the data may be completely suppressed, or it may just you know be such a high margin of error that it, it's completely uh, useless in terms of any kind of planning. Um, so that, that, and that's really why we say little to none, or uh, you know, meet the meet the established thresholds. Gosh, how about where um, right now theoretically we could have a um, block group that's 
we see it as non-residential, but by mid-decade, <laughs> we wind uh -huh. up with, um, you know, a, a large multifamily housing For sure. complex. Yeah. Um, how does that wind up in, you know, a, appearing in the ACS and that sort of thing? Yeah, so uh, that that is uh, an excellent question, and that's one of the reasons that we ask that, you know, if a PPO is not, a actual development or planning organization that they reach out to them uh, and try to see what the plans are for development for that area that they're responsible for so you can kind of plan around those things that's part of what the whole piece app is about is changing tracks and block groups to accommodate future development in the next 10 years in terms of the data that will be generated you know that um, uh, you know, obviously they wouldn't be in the, the 2020 uh, decennial census data in terms of ACS, it would be the same as any other development. Um, you know, if they make it into the ACS, uh, then the data would be published like any other area. Um, and we, could, we could get into that whole securitous route of how something makes it into the ACS, but um, that's kind of getting into the weeds, but it would be the same as any other area and it would come out as soon as we had that data collected, we would publish it. We wouldn't suppress that, um, but it would go through the same data disclosure and data review as any other area. So again, if it wound up that there was a new townhouse complex that went in, uh, you know, maybe 50 townhouses go in and in a block group that was previously completely undeveloped uh, and had no population, um, you know, it may end up that that data gets suppressed or that the data is just has such a high margin of error that it's pretty worthless. Um, so I don't know if that really directly answers your question, Ben. But Yeah, no, that's very helpful. Um, yeah. So there are two more questions and we have about two more minutes. So do we want to try and field these? Yeah, go, go quick and yeah. we'll try to get right. to them. Uh, Josh, is there a list of state leads on PSAP posted? What do state uh, agencies do to reach out? Yeah, not yet. Uh, that will be coming out soon. Uh, to reach out, go ahead and uh, contact that geo.psap that's on the page there. Uh, get your contact information um, through that venue there. Just give them your, your state, county, and, and they'll let you know. And then, uh, so this 2020 layer you just spoke of that the census has updated is the source review layer for any updates we make. And is the February webinar training solely on how to use the GUPS software? Uh, we are still in development of the webinars. That is going to be a large portion of it is how to use the software, but we also will cover the information that I covered today. So you're getting a preview of, of what we'll be covering in the webinar. Um, uh, the 2020 layer in GUPS is, is really just a reference. Um, it's, it's a proposed plan that can be used or not used as as, as you like. Um, again, the options are going to be to use that 2020, make updates to it and use it, or to start from 2010, start from scratch and, you know, do updates off of that. So we're, we, uh, it's not something that we're mandating. But again, if a county or, or, or uh, uh, if a county does not have a participant, we cannot identify a participant. Uh, and we get no feedback on that county, the 2020 plan is what we will be implementing for that county for the 2020 census. Great. Okay. Well, thank you so much uh, mm -hmm. to all our presenters and uh, Josh, especially uh, fielding all those questions. And uh, thank you everyone for participating. We'll be, um, as Penelope said, sending out the presentation and the recording. Uh, we also will try to make sure people know when um, the final PSAP criteria are published on the Federal Register, but I think you kind of know what, what's in it at this point. Um, the, uh, and also the participant list, as soon as we get word that uh, Census has published that, we'll, we'll put that out there as well. But again, you don't have to be on that list to participate. It's just that if you want to participate, you need to make sure that that person on that list knows you want to be involved. That's right. So, thank you so much, everyone. Thanks, everybody.